Hi, today we're going to talk about chromatographic separations. We're just going to go over some basic principles, but all of these principles apply to any sort of column chromatography, whether that be gas chromatography, high performance liquid chromatography, or ion chromatography. What all of these methods have in common are the ability to separate a mixture of analytes from each other. So why would you want to do that? The answer is that many detection methods like mass spectroscopy might not be able to analyze all of the analytes in the mixture because for many methods, peaks of different analytes may overlap. For example, look at these two mass spectra here. One is for decane and the other for dodecane, and you can see that they have many of the same peaks in common. So how would you know if you just had dodecane or a mixture of dodecane and decane? But if you could separate the decane from the dodecane somehow, you would be able to collect those spectra at different times. So all separations, whether chromatographic separations or otherwise, depend on differences in intermolecular forces between analytes. Because these intermolecular forces have different strengths, the analytes will be attracted differently to one substance over another. Now, when people say different intermolecular forces, they often think of analytes like pentane on the left here versus water. So just looking at this, you can tell that pentane is very hydrophobic or nonpolar and therefore only will have London dispersion or van der Waals forces. On the other hand, water is very polar and is going to have hydrogen bonding. So you end up with varying strengths of intermolecular forces, but you can also have forces somewhere between those two extremes. For example, Formic acid is polar, but it's not as polar as water. Acetic acid has both a polar and a nonpolar end, and butanoic acid is mostly nonpolar with a small polar end. Now let's look at a simple separation of two solids that you might do in organic lab. Our two solids in this case are table salt or sodium chloride and curcumin, aka turmeric. Sodium chloride is an ionic compound and therefore will do quite well in polar solvents. On the other hand, curcumin has some polar functional groups, but the majority of the molecule is nonpolar. So how would you separate these two things? I would start by putting the mixture of solids into a polar solvent like water inside of a separation funnel, and then adding a nonpolar solvent like hexane. At this point, you can shake everything until the solids dissolve. And because of the different intermolecular forces of the two substances, the curcumin will end up dissolving mostly in the hexane, while the sodium chloride will dissolve in the water. Because the hexane is less dense, it will separate and float on top of the water. At that point, you can remove the water from the bottom of the SEP funnel and evaporate it to remove the salt. Of course, separations like this are a pain to do and can really only separate two analytes at a time. Chromatography is designed to separate multiple analytes at once. So some of you may have done gel chromatography in a biology or biochem class, but in general, what we use in analytical chemistry is what we call column chromatography. In a nutshell, our column contains what we call a stationary phase, something that does not move, but our sample is then carried by what we call a mobile phase, which is something that can pass through the column and over the stationary phase. The mobile phase may be liquid or it may be gas. The separations happen because of the way that analytes interact differently with the stationary phase. So what does a stationary phase look like? Well, it really depends on the sort of column you're using based on the type of chromatography you want to do. For some types, a packed column is used. This is a column filled with some sort of beads with a very particular sort of surface. By contrast, a capillary column does not have packing of any sort, but instead has some sort of coating on the column wall. This may be a porous coating, so your analyte may go in and out of the porous coating, that's what we see in this picture. It may be some sort of electrostatic coating. Let's now talk about how an analyte moves through a chromatographic column. A sample is injected into the mobile phase, which carries it into the column. Now here that's shown as a single arrow, but of course the mobile phase is constantly moving. The column is always full of it. Sometimes the movement of the mobile phase causes the analyte to advance through the column. And then sometimes the analyte interacts with a stationary phase and basically gets stuck. And now what's sticking that analyte there, it's some sort of intermolecular force. So when it's in the stationary phase, an analyte is not moving down the column. The more an analyte interacts with a stationary phase, the longer it's gonna stay in the column. 
Even if you have two molecules of the exact same analyte, they may not get through the column in the same amount of time. For example, here I've shown two different analyte molecules, which are different colors, so we can tell them apart. But let's pretend they're the same substance. The purple molecule gets injected near the outside of the column. So its path is relatively straight, and it only interacts with three of our packing beads. By contrast, our red molecule is moving down the center of the column, and because its initial path goes straight into a bead, it ends up taking a winding route through the column, during which it interacts with the beads seven times. So obviously the purple molecule is going to get through faster and the red molecule is going to go through slower. Because remember, more time spent in the mobile phase means an analyte moves through the column quickly because the mobile phase is always moving. More time spent in the stationary phase means an analyte will move through the column more slowly. One of the side effects of this partitioning process is that the longer an analyte remains in the column, the more dilute it will become. This is because the longer an analyte is in the stationary phase, the more mobile phase will be pumped into that column during that time. And of course, since your analyte molecules are moving through at slightly different speeds, they end up in a larger volume of mobile phase. That makes it harder to detect your analyte when it finally emerges, or what we call eluting, so when it finally elutes from the column into the detector. As a result, we try not to keep analytes in the column any longer than necessary. So keep that in mind as we start talking about separating one analyte from another. How long analytes stay in the column, or as we say, how long they're retained, is very important. A chromatography system is efficiently designed when our analyte peaks come out sharp and narrow. This tells us that all of our analyte is eluding at the same time. If a peak is too wide, the analyte is holding on to the stationary phase too long and it's being diluted down and it tends to come out all spread out. Now let's look at two different ways to measure analyte retention. The first is what we call the retention factor, which is based on something that we call retention time. How long is that analyte in the column? Then there's that funny measurement that we call theoretical plates that calculates how many times an analyte partitions from stationary phase to mobile phase and back. So let's look at both of those two measurements in detail. Retention time is basically the time between when a sample enters the column and when it elutes or emerges from your column and into your detector. The instrument will generally measure that for you, and you'll see that written as T sub R. You can compare this then to the time we call T sub M, which is how long it takes a molecule of mobile phase to get through the column. Now, if T sub R equals T sub M, that means your analyte is always in the mobile phase, so it's moving just as fast as the mobile phase, and it never sticks to the stationary phase. We can use the retention time of an analyte to calculate the retention factor K. I've written K sub A here, but you would actually use a subscript related to the name of the analyte, like K sub dodecane. Now, as you can see, the retention factor is the retention time minus T sub M, so that's the retention time of the mobile phase, divided by this T sub M retention time of the mobile phase. So if T sub R equals T sub M, the retention factor is zero. In other words, the column doesn't slow it down at all, which is exactly what I said before. In general, small retention factors mean that analytes don't interact much with the stationary phase, while large retention factors mean that analytes love interacting with the stationary phase. You want to shoot for retention factors in a range of one to 10. If you go much above 10, your analyte will be diluted to the point that it may be hard to measure. So now we get to talk about theoretical plates. And when I do this, you know, try not to think of dinner plates, but rather as flat plates of metal stacked on top of each other. And each of those plates represents a phase transition. Now, I know that most of the time when you hear the term phase transition, you think of going from liquid to gas or something like that. But in chromatography, this means partitioning from stationary phase to mobile phase and vice versa. If you have very thin plates, that means there's a very short distance between where an analyte goes from stationary phase into mobile phase you know, obviously it moves when it's in the mobile phase and then it goes back into stationary phase again. So how far does it travel before it gets stuck? A thin plate means it doesn't go very far before it gets stuck again. Another way to think about this is that a column with a lot of theoretical plates holds onto your analyte pretty well because it keeps getting stuck. Whereas a column with only a few theoretical plates like this one on the right doesn't hold onto it as well. So, okay, these plates are theoretical plates how do we actually measure them? We're going to calculate this 
based on measurements from our chromatogram, the output from our detector. So first let's look at the equation. N is the number of theoretical plates in our column, which is equal to 5.54 times the retention time divided by peak width at half height, that quantity squared. Now, people are often confused by what peak width at half height means, so let's go into that in a little more detail. First, measure your peak height. I've actually done this with a ruler on a printout, but some software actually does it for you. Um, now you figure out where half that height is on your peak. And at that height on the peak, measure the width of the peak. Now, in this case, when I say measure the width, I don't mean get out your ruler and figure out how many centimeters it is. The correct unit for that width is minutes. I know that seems weird because we usually don't measure widths in time, but when it comes to chromatography peaks, we do. How long does it take between where the peak begins and where the peak ends? How long does it take for the analyte to start coming out and than to finish coming out. So when you have retention time divided by peak width in the formula, you end up with a unitless factor. Again, the number of theoretical plates tells you how well your column holds on to your analyte. The more theoretical plates you have, the longer it will hold on to it. Another way to think of how many transitions there are is the plate height of your column. Again, this is the actual distance a molecule of analyte travels between phase transitions. So you calculate this by dividing the length of your column which may vary quite a bit depending on what sort of chromatography you're doing by the number of theoretical plates. Now let's talk about one final way that we quantify how good a chromatographic separation is, which is the selectivity factor. You're going to want to optimize your separation so the analyte peaks that you see on your chromatogram are well separated and not overlapping at all. The way we quantify selectivity is by dividing the retention factors of our two analytes. By definition, the analyte with a higher retention factor is K sub B. If the two analytes elute from the column at the exact same time, they will also have the same retention factors and the selectivity will be one. But if one comes out way after the other, they're going to have very different retention factors and you're going to get a selectivity that's higher than one. So the higher your selectivity, the farther apart your peaks will be on a chromatogram. To summarize, chromatography is a way of separating analytes in a mixture so they can be analyzed separately from each other. We can use chromatographic methods to do qualitative analysis, basically where we look at retention times or detector outputs to identify our analytes, or we can use them for quantitative analysis by looking at peak areas to determine the concentration of each analyte, or we can do both. Now exactly how we do these things depends somewhat on which chromatographic method we're using, but understanding these basic principles will help you gain a deeper understanding of individual methods such as gas chromatography, liquid chromatography, and ion chromatography as you learn about them. I hope this was helpful and I look forward to seeing you soon.